Um, good morning, everybody. I'm, as Greg said, I'm John. I'm in charge of being wrong about the kernel on the internet. <laughs> um, and we have a, an interesting panel of folks to talk about kernel development issues here. I'm going to start by having them introduce themselves. I have a whole long list of questions, but we do have the microphone, so if you can possibly get your way to it and you have a question to ask, I'm sure they would be more than happy to answer it. I would encourage you to do so. But let's just go ahead and start with Thomas, if the panelists could introduce themselves and say what you do and why you're working with the kernel. So what I'm doing, uh, I'm maintaining interrupt subsystem, the timer subsystem, and I'm part of the x86 maintainers team and a currently hobbyist state maintainer of the real-time extensions. And your name is Thomas. And my name is Thomas Gleichsner. <laughs> I have a strong affinity to Mission Impossible. <laughs> uh, I'm Frederick Weisbecker, and I work for uh, Red Hat, and um, well, mostly on uh, no Hertz and Dintix uh, feature. So it's a subset of timers. So. Somehow I work for Thomas. <laughs> uh, my name is Grant Likely. I am the maintainer of the device tree subsystem. And I'm also uh, the, on the Tech Linux Foundation Technical Advisory Board as the chair. My name is Julia Lewall. I'm a researcher at INRIA in Paris. I work on um, tools to improve the quality of Linux code, in particular on Coxnl, which is a tool that has been used for making a lot of patches in Linux. Uh, my name is Boris, and uh, I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> Somebody thought I, I could have something to say, but other than that, I do a little bit of uh, RAS maintainership and a little bit of x86 and everything else that's fun in the kernel. All right, thank you. Well, when I was asking people what I should be asking the panel, there's, there's one topic that came up over and over again, and so let's just go ahead and get this over with, um, and then we can get to the more fun stuff. We've recently had a prominent developer out there saying that the kernel development community is, is sick. That was the word that was used. That we do not relate with each other well and that we are driving people out. And so I would like to ask what your perspective is on this. And I would ask that we focus not on this particular developer because he is not the only one to raise such issues, but to focus on our community. And what is the health of our development community and what maybe could we be doing better? Let's start at the far end. Um. Is there a problem? I don't know. I mean, I, I never had a problem with the kernel community, actually. So they can be harsh, but uh, yeah, well, people tend to choose themselves. So you tend to work better with some people and, and not so good with others. So, so are we I don't think we have a problem. So are we selecting for the people who can actually stay in the environment that we've created, or, or you just have to find your particular place? I wouldn't say selective. I mean, if people choose to stay with development, they stay. Okay, this sure. is my experience only, okay? It's just in my humble opinion. I never had a problem, I'm just a little one. But. Julia, what do you think? Uh, so I have made, uh, I don't work on any particular part of the kernel. I uh, fix bugs all over the kernel. Um, so I have interacted with a lot of people, maybe not in a very profound way, but at least in a, sort of one-time way. Um, overall, I've been very impressed by the uh, supportiveness of people and the constructiveness of comments. Uh, perhaps some people are more harsh about some things, but um, sometimes one does something that's foolish and um, maybe harsh comments are deserved. Um, I think if one is very motivated by working on the kernel, one has to just push forward somehow. Um, <clears throat> I mean, my experience with the kernel, I think 99% of the time, all of the communication and all the conversations have been, they've been great, they've been respectful, they've been uh, really productive and gotten good work done. Uh, but I don't think the problem is the 99% of the time. I think the problem is that there, when things do bubble to the surface, those are the conversations that can end up setting the tone for the entire community. Uh, and, and I am concerned about this. Uh, I think that it, uh, it keeps some people out of the community that would otherwise be, uh, that, that would otherwise be more involved. Um, 
So, I mean, I can't speak for all kernel maintainers, but I can speak for myself. And from my perspective, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to work in a community that will tear down other people, where the anger bubbles to the surface too quickly, or where uh, conversations start to degrade into attacks upon a person, or abuse on a person, instead of, uh, uh, instead of debating vigorously the, the code and the technical things that we're working on. Uh, so, from my perspective, it's, I think it's really important for the health of the community not to just kind of say, well, that's 1% and we'll just kind of ignore that, but to instead to be really clear about what my position is on, uh, on the way that we interact. And for, my, for me, it's, I don't want to be ever in a conversation where I am tearing down or abusing another developer who is working here. And so, if, if that happens, uh, on any of the mailing lists that I'm going to, I'm going to, talk, I'm going to call you on it. I'll talk to you about it privately, but I'll call you on it. And I will hope that if when, you know, when I screw up and when I start to get emotional about something and cross a line, that you'll do the same for me. So... <laughs> So, if there is something that I think we could do better with the community is perhaps the development process, which is, which I think is sometimes a bit heavy, um, not only for newcomers but also for uh, regular contributors. I mean, at least that's how I feel myself. I can't speak for everyone, but uh, yeah, the, the life cycle of a patch is uh, usually very, very long. Uh, from the time you write the patch, then, well, that is just 5% of the development process. Then you have to write the changelog, post to the, uh, to the mailing list, then waiting for uh, reviews, then you have to iterate again. So sometimes if you just have a one line change to do, you think about it twice before investing on it. Because it's, yeah, always quite some time to invest, even for very little changes. Thomas? Uh, I know that I'm of the persons who can get emotional on the mailing list. I'm not looking for an excuse for that. But on the other hand, if you're in a maintainer's position and you get bombarded with patches, and the patch quality is lousy as hell, so you go there and say very politely, hey, this is wrong for a technical reason. Uh, please change this. Please do another, a different approach. The same person come back within 24 hours with another patch series, which is similarly wrong, but slightly different. And you start over and uh, make it a little bit more clear. And I'm really trying hard to keep calm, but after you get the fifth version of shit, Really, there is a point where I can't uh, stay calm anymore because it doesn't help. I mean, the only thing that helps at some point is tell these people to go away. Look for someone who is actually willing to help them to do their job. I can't do that. I can't hurt hundreds of random developers all over the world. That's just a time question. I mean, I tried the clone thing, it comes always back with e too many instances. Actually, I can understand what Thomas says. I mean, you sit there and review patches all the time, and you get the pad, the next version, and you say, change it this way, change it that way, and then you get a different change, a completely different one. And sometimes you just... But I, but I, don't, I, I don't think... But no, I have I'll to say, there's a, there's a lot of positive examples where you actually can work very, work very well with people. Yeah. You explain them where you're going, they come back after a week and have intelligent questions about it and have maybe an, an, uh, uh, a different solution to it and we discuss it and then they go back and write a real, real great patch that. I mean, that's, that's the fun part of being a maintainer. You see that actually they thought about it, like really thought about it. Right. Well, and, and I think that that's important, is that one of, the, one of the key factors of our community is that we're really good at, at, at attacking a problem and coming up with good solutions. And we're not okay with hacky solutions. 
I don't think we. I don't think the two things that are going on are mutually exclusive. We cannot give up the the technical excellence that we demand. Uh, but I think at the same time we can be clear about you know there's we're not going to attack people in the process. Well, what I do, for example, when I'm really frustrated, I go for a run. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> Makes sense. All right, we have a question from the audience here. I have a two-part question about device trees. <laughs> Part can one. I, can, can I go now? <laughs> no. <laughs> Part one, when are we going to get them out of the kernel tree? Part two, when are we going to see them perhaps used on other architectures more prominently, x86 or anything other than the couple that are currently using them? Thank you. Right, so I guess I'll take that one. <laughs> uh, okay, so the first part, um, device trees out of the kernel. It's, we've gone back and forth on that a number of times. Uh, it would be really good to have a separate repository. It's really painful for some developers to do that for a lot of the embedded platforms because now you've got two repositories that you need to build from. Uh, so we've made some directions. That there is actually a kernel tree that um, uh, on kernel.org that's been maintaining a mirror of just the device tree files that's been kind of a staging first step. A big part of the problem is no one's working on it. And you know, to, to have someone get a bee in their bonnet to actually get this, get this done and make it so that we can move uh, the device tree files out of the kernel piecewise so that you know, we've got some in the kernel tree for early development but still be able to go to an external repository to get them, that would be cool. Um, as for seeing it on other architectures, we've actually, there's a, going to be a session later today where we're going to talk about what are the next steps? And one of the things that should be, um, one of the things that I think needs to be done is we've got a, we do have a specification for device tree, and it's kind of old. Uh, it's been around for a few years. There's a lot of new things that have been done. Uh, I think getting that spec restarted is an important part of that. And I want to, as for other architectures like x86, there is a little bit of use on, on XA6 for specialized use cases, uh, like when you've got a PCI add-in board with like an FPGA and the configuration that that may change. But it really is, what, are, what do people need? It's, I'm happy to merge the code. Device tree works on all, the test cases will pass on x86. Uh, but I haven't seen patches of people who have got things they are burning to be able to do on x86. We always hear that this, uh, the kernel is moving at this incredible speed, we get more and more patches, but uh, there are certainly parts of the kernel that don't get so much love. So what do you think are the parts of the kernel where, that we should uh, put more work in? TTY layer. <laughs> We have a volunteer. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Everyone runs away from that one. I saw a lot of people go nuts on it, so I don't want to be part of that. You know, the, the parts of the kernel that get work are the parts of the kernel that bother people, typically. You know, if something is not working the way you want it to, to work, then eventually you get fed up and you go and you fix it. And so the parts that are unloved, often that's an indication that it's something that's not really being used all that much. Either that or it's just something that nobody can quite bother to get around to, um, to fixing yet. So something that was on my list is when, when are we going to fix the year 2038 problem? Uh, so uh, we that could need to do it. I mean, from the core timekeeping perspective, we are in a good shape now. So we have converted all the core code to, over to, to use 64-bit uh, uh, seconds representation even on 32-bit machines. So that's, uh, that has been merged in... 317, I think. Um, so yes, but there's still the, the hard work to do to um, go through all the affected user space interfaces. I mean, the cleaning up the, the, the 
in kernel uses is pretty much a no-brainer. But the hard part will be to fix up the user space interfaces because we actually cannot change them without breaking the world in some more. I mean, the BSDs really did a great job on it, but they have it easy. They have the user space in the same tree, so they did a wholesale change, yeah. recompile and uh, wait what explodes. Uh, so what we have to do is actually go and analyze all and every uh, syscall interface. The syscalls are not the hard part. The hard part are the IOCTLs, uh, IO and there's a zoo of it. So you have to go through and look for uh, stuff which uses time specs, time walls, or time t, and create new either ioctals or uh, new syscalls. And then the next step is going to be that user space has to support the new interfaces, and then applications have to take it up. So this is going to be, I'm not afraid of the kernel part of the work, I'm more afraid of the overall ecosystem change. So along the lines of the overall system and parts of the kernel needing love, we used to have a, a regressions maintainer, somebody who tracked the regressions in each kernel release and helped to make sure we fixed them. And that person found other work to do some years ago and we have nobody doing that. And so there were concerns, certainly, that we would lose track of regressions and that perhaps our kernel quality would go down. What we've heard from Olaf, for example, is that this has not happened. What we've heard at the kernel summit as well is that this has not happened. That if anything, we're, we're producing fewer regressions than we used to, both in terms of functionality and in terms of performance. And I'm curious if, if you all agree that we're getting better, and if so, how is this happening? How are we getting better? I think most of it is that we do have more tools, we do have more internal debug infrastructure, and we do have more fully automated testing, which catches a lot of things mm -hmm. before they start to explode in the face of users. We've also gotten better at, at process, at what we're doing. Uh, it's very, very clear before a maintainer sends a tree to Linus or a sub-maintainer to their maintainer, you know, make sure you're kernel builds on all mod config on x86. And you know, these are things that I think a few years ago were more sloppy than they are now. And we have the zero day testing. I think that changed a lot of, improved a lot. Yeah, and stuff like Julia is doing with, with her static analysis tools and uh, actually finding a lot of interesting bugs in the kernel. Yeah, it's, okay. yes. It's, it's, if for people who are not familiar with it, so every day um, a whole bunch of different uh, compilation with many different options is run, many different configurations, and many diff a number of tools that are included in the kernel are run over all of the patches that have been contributed. And then the developers who contributed any patch that causes a problem are informed immediately. And hopefully, since they were thinking about the code within the last 24 hours, they will be motivated to fix up the problem quickly. And I think, in general, the response has been very good, and people fix up their code as they should. Oh, and also, uh, I, I tend to see like bug reports in LKML, but not so often. We could use somebody to, I don't know, track those, maybe. And uh, <clears throat> another way to get to get involved in the kernel is not only just fixing a, just trying to analyze a bug and try to fix it. It's much better way than cleaning white, white space. So, yeah. Yeah, we, we have enough white space maintainers. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. An interesting, one of the more interesting changes that's gone into 3.18 is in the networking layer. And it's a very simple change. It takes the form of, of a flag passed to device drivers saying that there are more packets coming, so you don't have to actually kick the hardware yet to make it going. And this has improved our transmit performance considerably, especially with small packets, which was a big problem for Linux for quite a while. A very simple change. And um, Jens Axpo kind of ironically pointed out that the block layer has had a very similar mechanism for years, where they have said there's, there's more requests coming, so you can do this. Um, so my question is, and I want to start with Julia, since perhaps you put your fingers into more parts of the kernel than almost anybody else around. Mm -hmm. How are we communicating between the various subsystems of the kernel and moving good ideas from one part to the other? Do you see bad ideas that show up that need to be fixed here and then they show up again over here? That sort of thing. 
Or do we, I mean, sometimes it seems like the kernel is, is a lot of different silos and areas that people don't understand across them. And is that a problem, or do we actually do well at moving ideas across the kernel? Yes, I'm not sure we do so well. Um, so an example that I have studied uh, a bit is the DevM function, so it allows managed memory. And this is something that was introduced in 2007. And so I made a graph for one kind of driver where it could be used, and the uptake was extremely slow for a long time. And then eventually it took off. Um, and then it slowly has moved, it has become available in more different types of devices. And then maybe as people have gotten more aware of it, it the, up, the, the take up has been quicker for some other kinds of devices. Um, but there's still a lot of other opportunities for its use. And it's something that's in some sense, I mean, it's not a big thing, it's just the management of different kinds of resources. Um, but it's something that people very often do wrong. And the use of these DevM functions eliminates the possibility of doing things wrong. Um, so it's something that in some sense is very important. So. I've seen in that case the communication between different subsystems being rather slow. Um. I tend to use LWN when I don't know. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any thoughts on, on that issue? Grant, how does ARM learn from the other architectures? This is part. How does ARM learn from the other architectures, say? Are there good ideas coming from other architectures, um, or two other pain, architectures? Uh, painfully, is that a useful answer? Uh, it's, uh, I think that um, actually ARM and x86, the, those are two extremes of uh, different ways to approach platforms. And I think that there's been a lot of things that have worked quite well in the x86, like in the, the, the server. Uh, uh, server general purpose desktop market uh, on x86 that we've had to learn the hard way on, on ARM. Uh, so there has been a lot of, as we're going from, you know, a good example is single kernel image. Instead of having to build a separate kernel for every single platform, we want to have a single kernel. And there's been, we've recognized that there's a problem that you know, cannot just continue to do what we were doing. And then it was going and looking for the solution. And it was going and, okay, well, we know this isn't good. We know we need to have single kernel image. And then going and looking at x86 or PowerPC when we want to figure out, when we're trying to solve the individual technical problems that are associated with that. So it's, it's been something of only when the problem is recognized and becomes, uh, becomes important or urgent does it actually go looking for these other things? Um, another example would be, I mean, RCU has been in the kernel for years and years and years. Uh, I'm just now looking at bringing RCU into the device tree infrastructure uh, because there's patches that have been, uh, there's been a patch set that's been worked on the last couple of years by uh, Pentelis to add dynamic changes to the device tree. Well, we've got this kind of awful locking problem and RCU solves that locking problem, and we, I wouldn't have made the jump to do that because there wasn't a burning need to do so until this happened. Okay, that sort of leads into another question I have, because RCU, the read copy update mechanism, is great for scalability and so on, but it definitely adds complexity to the code that, that is in, introduced into. In a lot of places, we are adding a lot of complexity for um, what sometimes seem like crazy use cases, you know, people wanting no hertz um, CPUs, for example, or um, things like that. Are we approaching a complexity cliff or are we managing that so far? I think due to the fact that we spent a lot of time in the last 10 years to move actually complex stuff out of architectures and into the cool code, we have a very small spot where we handle the complexity. Yeah. Yes, we are aiming to it a complexity cliff, but we are going. We are taking care of not jumping down to, down the cliff too fast. Yeah. I, I think we've done a good job as well of compartmentalizing the complexity, where the block layer is complex, but it doesn't interact with CPU power management which is also complex. Now, I mean, there's, 
varying levels. Some, some things are, are nice and contained, other things end up having hooks all through the kernel. Um, I think we're doing okay, though. And we are good in, in rebooting stuff which we, where we went down the wrong road. Once we stand just in front of the clip, we usually turn back. <laughs> <laughs> There's a moment of, oh, that's awful, let's not do that. Pardon? There's a moment of, oh, that's awful, let's not do yeah. that. And uh, in some points you have to go down to that point where you actually figure out it was the wrong, the wrong approach. I mean, some of the approaches worked very well 10 years ago. CPU hot plug is one of those. I mean, uh, it uh, still works in that, some way. Yeah, and, and that's one of the areas where um, I think we're actually quite conservative uh, and quite careful when we start touching the complex parts. I mean, the, the CPU power management is a good example of that, where there's been, you know, uh, power aware scheduling has been an ongoing topic for the last number of years. And, you know, some people are frustrated that it's not getting into the kernel. But this is not an easy problem. It's not easy to come up with a solution that's going to work across all the different platforms that Linux runs on. Uh, so it, it's, in a sense, it kind of has to be painful to make sure we're vigorously dealing with all the, the corner cases that we're going to have to deal with. I think complexity is also <clears throat> on the table when you do a review. For example, you always ask yourself, is, it, uh, is the complexity worth the trouble? Is it going to bring us anything? And I've seen cases where we add the complexity and a couple of reviews days later, we just remove it because it's unhandleable. We go like, eh. Make it simple, it's better, sometimes. We have a question. Hi, so uh, there was a keynote in San Jose by Tim Bird about running Linux on small devices. And there's a lot of differences of opinion on how small is too small to be considering running Linux. Um, what would be some of your thoughts on where that barrier might be? Uh, I would say the barrier is the amount of time someone's willing to work on getting the Linux kernel running on that device. It's, it's going to be, my view on the thing on it is that I think the work to shrink the kernel is great. It's fantastic. I, I support that all the way. Uh, the problem is, is that there's very few people who are either have the funding to you know, pay for them to work on that, or interest or product that they actually need that for. You know, we still are in the realm of, especially on the small devices, the smaller devices just keep getting cheaper. And it's easy to throw more resources at it. Uh, so there's lots of places where it would be admin, where having shrinking down the kernel and making it smaller would be valuable, but it hasn't gotten the attention, it hasn't gotten the um, priority to actually work on it and make it happen. Uh, now, as far as what's too, what is actually too small, there is of course going to be a limit where you know our whole code base, you know, you're, you're not going to run it on an AT tiny 8-bit microcontroller. But I, I don't know how to answer the question of what's, what's too small, because if someone's successful at getting it running and the patches aren't awful, why wouldn't we pick it up? You, you say that, Grant, but there's been some real pushback against some of the tinification patches that have been put out so far, that either they bring an explosion of configuration options or they would say, put the network stack in a non-standard compliant sort of form, good enough for the people who want to use it, but not good enough for the networking maintainers. We, we do run into people who resist that kind of change and it makes it harder to get it in. In general, one could extend the question to how far should we push things in the kernel to meet the, the requirements, the use cases of people that we might regard as being crazy users? the people who want to have CPUs with no kernel involvement at all, so that they can run their task on it and not even have to deal with, with the latency caused by an interrupt. Or you know, people who want to run thousands and thousands of processors, or people who want to run on some sort of little smart dust thing that you're gonna spread all over the world. You know, these are use cases that push the boundary. How far are we willing to go to support those? I guess it long, as long as it doesn't violate common sense and violate 
uh, the functionality itself and restricts uh, further development, we will go the same road we did for the last 20 years, which has to accommodate with the needs. But then, uh, the example you brought up with networking, I mean, uh, that's why I said it violates common sense. I mean, if you want to have Internet of Things and then get uh, re restrict, remove the, the firewall code and the IP tables code from the networking layer, I mean, um, everybody's talking about security. I don't want to have an insecure refrigerator in my house. I mean, I don't want to have an internet-connected refrigerator at all. <laughs> <laughs> but if people insist on having that, then we should actually uh, tell them, no, getting rid of the security features and just having the next annoying, uh, annoyingly uh, wrong and, and in, um, incomplete TCP IP stack out there is not an option we support actively. We so, don't want to encourage people to so do stupid the, things. The, the counterpoint to that is that the, there are going to be a certain segment of devices that are not able to, that, that are going to require a smaller kernel, that are not going to be able to have all the features. Uh, and so the alternatives, there's a choice then presented to them is either uh, Get this, get the smaller, get the features removed from Linux, or be able to turn them off, or go to a different operating environment. And I'm not, I'm not comfortable pushing people away just on that. What I think is a more important is the the comfort level of the maintainer on whether or not those patches are just going to cause a maintenance nightmare over the long term. I think the explosion of configuration options is probably the most valid response to turning things off. If it's going to make the code base difficult to maintain, then those are the kind of horrible patches that I think we should be saying no to. But otherwise, I don't see the problem. Well, I see a problem in encouraging people to do stupid things. I mean, people do stupid things anyway, but I, as a maintainer, don't want to encourage them and actively help them to shoot themselves. I mean, I'm feeling bad about that, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have another question over here. Hello. Um, so I'd just like to lend my voice to the uh, small kernel. Uh, I don't think Internet of Things is going to be so much uh, refrigerators being connected to the Internet, but I think... You're yeah, they're talking the about putting Linux into light bulbs, I know. <laughs> well, I was thinking more of like all the biometric, you know, my heart rate and steps and things like that. And I'm seeing lots of things where having a secure, uh, having a secure network stack, secure BLE stack um, in a pretty small, pretty small footprint would be, would be exceptional. And, and we're seeing people kind of fork off and use free RTOS and, and other things because they can get these things. But having Linux be able to fill that niche would mean, in, you know, just a wealth of opportunities, you know, even probably 10x, 100x what uh, Android has afforded uh, Linux these days. Um, that's just, you know, that's just what I've seen. Okay. Any Did comments? I don't think I don't think it's so. I, I don't think it's so like. Um, I, I think there's there's really valid use cases here. I don't think it should just be. I think it's something that that we should work towards. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's no, there's nothing wrong in 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 getting Linux into your biometric device or your light bulb. I don't care. But um, I, we have to have the people who actively work on that and work together with the maintainers to to not make it a nightmare. So one of the patches I saw floating around, it was the hell of an if uh, horror over 10 source files sprinkled if def constructs in. And then I'm going to say as a, as a maintainer, no way. Go back, do it in a different way. So figure out how to do it proper. We, we have a lot of mechanisms to, to do it right. So, but then you have to have a lot of people going through all over the tree 
and figure out how to solve that tinification problem in the various places, working with the various maintainers without uh, um, imposing um, any barriers on the development of, of Linux and then of the evolvement of the code. I mean, I, I think there's and the the solution cannot be okay. We sprinkle uh, ten tons of if defs around the kernel and then run away screaming and say, "Yeah, we we made it." No, that's not going to happen. I mean, if people come with proper patches and, and they yeah. are not hurting anything, nobody will object to, to, to merge them. And if you do that, do the, apply the if devs, and then you go and change that and break some device, people go screaming, you just broke my device, and then it becomes a real, real maintenance nightmare. So right. this is like a big problem. So if it's no, done clean, I don't think we Stuff care. has to be well thought out. I mean, we have brought large and complex patches into the kernel without breaking the world, without imposing too much trouble and the involvement. And if the tinification stuff uh, wants to, to, to achieve that goal, they should just do it. I mean, it's, it's doable, it's not rocket science, it's just a hell of a work. And you need people who are not scared to touch every other file in the kernel. And the, the other thing with doing that work is it's, it's very fragile. It's because when you, the, when you get to that, you're talking about a very small subset of devices that not a whole lot of people actually get around to testing. So without someone really keen on getting in there and making sure that the, the tiny configurations still work over the long time, it will end up bit rotting. It will end up not being useful in a year after the patches are merged. I've tried to be a little bit more positive than what um, <laughs> others have <laughs> pointed out. Um, when I look across the kernel code, I see a lot of, um, there's a lot of old code coexisting with new code and different small variations of things. And it could be that a tinification perspective could motivate people to clean up some of that and um, improve the general quality of the code and understandability, maintainability yeah, of the code and so mm -hmm. on. So. Yeah. I think so you're right. Of you. Uni unification of mm -hmm. copied code should be a large portion of the tinification project. Mm -hmm. well, it's not just we copied have code, but small variations copied. of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah we have mindlessly copied code all over yeah. the place. Okay, I, I think that what we should do is we should move on to the next question sure. so that we have time to answer them before the, we run out. Yeah. Okay, this is essentially just a comment um, from a different direction. So at SUSE, we have been working with the high-end machines and, you know, 4K CPUs and whatever, and trying to get that stuff working with some vendors a while ago. And I think when, when you're doing reasonably weird stuff, there's a certain amount of pain that you have to endure yourself. So which means um, there's certain things that we actually have tried to push in the kernel and in other areas we got a firm no. And that doesn't mean we have to turn away from Linux, it just has to mean we have to carry those patches ourselves. And I think that is also an option for the tinification. If you are a vendor of a small form factor device with whatever requirements on the small side of things, um, rather than breaking the kernel for everybody, there's a certain you know, justice to actually keep some of the painful stuff on yourself. With, with tinification, that may really be true, just because everybody needs their kernel to be tiny in a different way. And they have their thing that they can do without. And so I think people will end up carrying some of that. Next. Okay, I would like to ask a question. Or if So the phones are basically, pretty much all of them are running, running Linux now, but there doesn't seem to be a single phone capable of running mainline Linux. So is it going to change? Can we do something to help? It's really a big area. Well, of course, now we're talking user space because the, the kernel they're running, and they're running something very close to a mainline kernel. You can run mainline kernels on an awful lot of devices with the, the usual caveat of binary-only drivers, which is a, a long-standing problem that we've been fighting for years. In terms of getting a mainline distribution running, people have done that on various devices. I don't know a single phone that could run mainline kernel. I'm talking kernel, actually. I don't know a single device that can do that. Like, I can run on serial port and... Uh, no, there, no, there's there. a look, few look, devices look that are mainlined. 
I, I, can't, I can't, can't remember them off the top of my head, but, but it, I don't know if they'll... Like the, <laughs> Tom knows. What we mean is usable as a phone. <laughs> Not just, yeah, I can use it that's, as a toy, I've got mainline running on my N1, it's I have a phone that's running mainline and I'm making a call, I'm sending a text, but it's really mainline, it's not the vendor lock-in. Yeah, but we're, this is but, really a user space problem, right? The, the kernel can do it. No, um, actually, yeah. actually, no, that's not true. There's, uh, there's still a problem of, there's a lot of patches that end up being in the vendor trees for the kernel that don't make it into mainline. Uh, pretty much every main line, every phone that's shipped has its own patches that are on top that, to make the hardware work. And it's a whole lot better than it used to be, but it's still not there. And I mean, that's, I mean, I, I work for Lenaro, uh, so I, I see a lot of this across the industry. I don't have, you know, I don't know what the solution is other than I know what little bits of the puzzle are. And one of those is continuing to go back to the SOC vendors and helping them and pushing them and encouraging them to mainline their code. So how are we going to fix the binary driver problem? In one minute. In one minute. <laughs> Complain a lot. Uh, it's... We don't have... It's not something that we can compel. It's not something that we can force. Uh, the best thing that we can do is, I think, to be talking to these companies and continuing to say, you know, you're just making it hard for yourself. It's much better for the quality of the kernel, for the quality of the products that are coming out, if we can get open source drivers. Uh, and within the companies that have graphics IP or radio IP, it requires a culture shift within within those companies. I mean, we can't do much about it as long as the phone manufacturers actually just accept the state of the uh, yeah. of it. And as long as the only the only people who can put pressure on the on the chip manufacturers or actually the phone manufacturers. And if they don't care, there's nothing we can do about it. I mean, we can tell them that they are doing stupid, but they don't, don't want to listen. They didn't listen the last 20 years. Why should they start listening now? So, mm -hmm. no, it's, not, it's not something we can do much about it. I mean, we can talk to people, but that's everything, all we can do. Although to say all we can do seems to be a kind of defeatist, it's actually quite a, that's one of the things that we have at our disposal is we've got an awful lot of influence uh, in the way that engineers are thinking and especially uh, I think engineers who are coming up through engineering school now are having far more exposure to open source and thinking in terms of free software than 10 years ago, than 20 years ago, and so on. So I, I think the culture is shifting, and that's a good thing. All right, well, looking forward to their contributions. Meanwhile, we are out of time. I think it's time for the break. So I would like to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. <laughs>